Hi, in this video, I am going to go through um, the OCR chemistry at A-level paper. This is paper one. Um, uh, and it's the October 2021 paper. Uh, this is the second half of the paper. I did the first half in an earlier video. Okay, so question 18. Um, a student carries out an experiment to just determine the percentage by mass of copper in an ore containing copper and its plus two oxidation states. We can that's going to be like copper two plus ions probably okay uh, a student is provided with a sample of the copper ore and potassium iodide solution and sodium thiosulfate solution so it's going to be an iodine titration okay so right um let's see what's going to happen here right so they're going to get the um step one they're going to get the, the ore and dissolve it in nitric acid, okay? And that's going to solubilize all the copper two plus ions. Uh, they're going to filter it to get rid of all the bits, step two. Step three, they're going to then react that copper two plus is reduced by I minus ions um, to copper iodide, copper one iodide, and the iodine itself is oxidized in the process to I2. So then they're going to, in step four, they're going to find out how much I2 they've got, how much iodine by titrating against, against sodium thiosulfate, which is a pretty standard um, uh, technique to work out how much iodine. So you find out the moles of iodine, find out the moles of copper, find out the percentage purity of the copper. That's, the, that's overall what's going to happen. Okay, in step one, the student observed that bubbles of gas were produced. In step one, it's when you added nitric acid to the copper ore. Now, what gas could that be? Well, don't be fooled into thinking it's hydrogen. You know, copper and nitric acid will, acids will react with reactive metals, but copper is not a reactive metal, and it's not here as a metal anyway, it's here as a copper iron. So the only other gas it could be a carbon dioxide. Um, um, and it's that's because you're reacting a carbonate with an acid and it's probably copper carbonate. And that would be the formula of copper two carbonate. A carbonate ion is CO3 two minus, yeah. Um, so let's, we've got right an equation for the formation of uh, how that reacts with nitric acid then. Um, so copper carbonate plus nitric acid uh, is gonna give you copper nitrate Nitrate ion, of course, is minus one. So that's going to be the form of copper nitrate. And CO2, that's the gas, and water. And to balance that, you need a two there. So, okay. Now, B, a bit more difficult. Write in an ionic equation, including state symbols, for the reaction in step three. Now, step three is when you're going to react the potassium iodide with... Um, uh, with the with the copper ions. So just to show what happens here, let's see what happens. Right, the copper two plus ion is going to be reduced to copper one iodide. Okay, so we're going to need an electron there, and we're also going to need an iodide ion. Okay, copper one iodide is a well, it says it's a precipitate. So it's telling you that that is a solid, okay, precipitates out. Um, right, and while that happens, so there the copper has become reduced. The other half equation for that would be the, um, the iodine being oxidized. Sorry about that. So the iodine has been oxidized. Let's write the equation for that. So we're going to have I minus uh, goes to I2. We're going to need two of those, both in aqueous solution. Um, and we're going to have two electrons there. So let me put my two up in the wrong place there. Two minus. So we're going to have to multiply that equation by two and add them together. So if we do that. We get copper two plus, two copper two plus. We're gonna need four iodides altogether. We need two from this one and two from that one. And we're gonna get uh, 
copper one iodide, which is a solid, two of those, and I2. There is our equation and everything else is in aqueous solution, okay. Okay, now in the next step, in step four, you titrate the iodine, which we made here. You titrate the iodine against um, five sulfate. Now, uh, you should remember this, a suitable indicator for this is you, when you're doing these kind of titrations, you usually use starch. Okay, that's the indicator. When you've got some iodine present, and you usually add it right at the end when you're getting towards the end point. Uh, iodine forms a black complex, blue black complex with starch. Uh, once you've got rid of all the iodine with the thiosulfate, it goes colorless. Um, so, yeah, just to show you that the reaction between iodine and thiosulfate is gives you it in the question, but just save me scrolling up the screen. Um, so, one iodine reacts with the iodine gets reduced back to iodide ions. Of course, they don't form a complex of starch, so they're colorless, and you get the I, the thiosulfate gets oxidized. Okay. Okay, determine the percentage by mass of copper in the copper ore. Uh, this is four marks and give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. So what I've done is I've recopied the method down again here so that we can see what we're doing. Okay, I've drawn some little diagrams. Okay, so look, step one, we have got the, um, step one we've got here. We've got our 2.5 grams of ore dissolved in the nitric acid. Uh, then we filtered it. Step two, step three, added excess Ki. And when you do that, you form, it, goes, it will go brown uh, because you're forming uh, iodine. You also form copper one iodide, which is a white precipitate, so it tends to look like sort of milky coffee, that, that thing there. And then they they don't do any dilution with, with this iodine solution. They get it straight into a conical flask here, and they titrate it against the thiosulfate. Um, and uh, the thiosulfate there, um, it tells us 26.55 um, 26 centimeters cubed is the titer. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to find out the moles of thiosulfate we've got in the titer here. So moles of thio used, let's do that, is going to be times volume. The concentration is 0 0.02. The volume is 26.55 centimeters cubed. So that's 0 0.02655 dm cubed. Um, and that gives us a um, number of moles of thiosulfate of um, 5.31 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay. Now, from the moles of thiosulfate, we can work out how many moles of iodine. Look, two moles of thiosulfate. Uh, React with one mole of iodine. So I'm going to do that next here. So moles of I2 formed is equal to this moles of thiosulfate divided by two. Okay, that's equal to um, 2.655 times 10 to the minus four. Okay, now from that we can work out the moles of uh, copper two ions because look here, we've got the equation here. Two moles of copper react with one mole of iodine. So the moles of copper two plus ions we had there, I have to double it again, is 2.655 times 10 to the minus four multiplied by two, which takes it back up to that 5.31 times 10 to the minus four. How many moles of copper two plus we've got? Okay, now 
But the question asks us to work out the percentage copper in the ore. Now we know that every one mole of copper two plus, right, so this gives, means you've got one mole of copper. So how do we work out the mass of copper? So the mass of the copper is just going to be equal to the moles of copper multiplied by uh, the atomic mass of copper, which is 63.5. So that's 5.31 times 10 to the minus two times 63.5. Uh, that gives us 0 0.03371 grams, okay? Now we need to work out the percentage of copper. So the percentage of copper in the ore, well, we had 2.50 grams of ore, didn't we, all together. And how much copper, that is copper is that much. So the percentage of copper is 0 0.03371 over 2.5 multiplied by 100. And that gives us 1.35%. Um, Okay, that is our answer there. Okay, so it carries on asking some more questions about this method they've used here. Okay, oh, and it's appropriate number of significant figures. Yeah, it should be to three significant figures because if you look, all the data is given to three sig figs. So that's what we should give our answer to. E, uh, now explain whether the calculated percentage of mass of copper would be higher or lower if, if the following changes to the method we use, right? First of all, the potassium iodide was not in excess in step three. Well, if you didn't have enough potassium iodide, you would not form, you'd form less iodine than you should, okay? Uh, that would mean that you'd assume there is less copper than there really is. So your value would be lower, percentage would be lower. It'd be incorrect. Right, this one here, a trick question. The burette readings are taken from the top of the meniscus. Now, of course, they should be taken from the bottom of the meniscus. But if you take them from the top of the meniscus, it won't make any difference because you take uh, no difference is the answer, basically. Why is that? It's because you, uh, you take an initial reading and the final reading. So the sort of mistake you're making when you make the initial reading is kind of like cancelled out by the mistake you take with the final reading. So that it wouldn't make any difference to your answer. Okay, the student modifies the method in order to obtain a more accurate value for the percentage mass of copper, okay? The student did, did, decided to use 25 grams of copper. Now, in the original method, they used 2.5 grams. I think they're trying to give you a bit of hint there. Uh, they, they use 10 times as much more copper ore. That means you can, and uh, I think you, you're going to make a lot more. Obviously, you wouldn't use that and do the same method because then you'd end up having to put, you'd need lots and lots of thiosulfate solutions to neutralize the iodine. I think what you should do is, uh, another problem is you probably realize that they've only done one titration here. You want to do multiple titrations. So what you'd do is you'd get 25 grams of copper and you'd make up, <coughs> you, so you'd, you'd add the, Add the Ki, you get your I2 solution. And then you'd make that up to 250 centimeters cubed in a volumetric flask. Uh, and then you would take out, what you normally do is you take out 25 centimeters cubed with a pipette. Uh, for your titration. And you do multiple titrations until you've got concordant results and you take an average. The problem with the method they do really is they're only doing, they've only, they're, they've only done one, one titration and then you, you, that's not really good enough. Uh, and the ideal thing is to make up more solution, make up 10 times the volume that you actually need, you know, 250. If you've used 10 times the amount of mass, and then you can take out 25 centimeter cube uh, portions of that and do titration with it. Okay, on to a question about uh, electric chemistry now. Okay, 
So you've got electrochemical series there. <coughs> um, a student sets up an electrochemical cell based on redox systems one and four. Uh, draw a labeled diagram to show how this cell could be set up in the laboratory. Okay, so right, I've drawn a couple of beakers there. Now you should put the most positive one on the right. So we should really have the, the manganate system on the right. Okay, so we're gonna have here, you're gonna put in there manganate ions, and you'd also need H plus ions because if you look at that equation, there's H plus ions here. And you'd need the reduced form of that, which is MN2 plus ions. Question doesn't say anything about standard conditions, but you should really put, if you're doing standard conditions, they should all be one mole per decimeter cubed. Now you haven't got any metal there, so you're going to have to have a piece of platinum, okay? A platinum electrode. All right, in the other one, in the left-hand beaker, we're going to have, um, we've got chromium three plus ions. We have got metal there, we've got chromium, so we'd have a piece of chromium metal there as the electrode. Uh, we'd also need a salt bridge here. Uh, and then you're going to connect that up to a voltmeter, a high resistance voltmeter. Three marks, okay. Um, plenty of, uh, that's where you get your three marks from, mentioning all of that. Okay, right. Uh, construct the equation, the, the equation for the overall cell reaction. Well, first of all, we have to think which way is the reaction going to go, which is, there's the two, there's the two uh, uh, electrodes that we're talking about, which is the most positive, it's this one here. Now, this is the most positive, it's best at taking in electrons, so that means that one is going to go forwards. This is the most negative, so it's the best at pushing away electrons, so that's going to go backwards, and we have to remember right, that we have to balance the number of electrons. Now we've got three electrons in the top one and five minutes. So the only way we can do that is we times that one by five and multiply that one by three and then add them together. So we're going to get five CR three plus, sorry, five CR uh, plus three manganate ions, three times eight, 24 H plus ions. Um, that's going to give us uh, five chromium ions, um, three manganate ions, manganese ions, sorry, and then two plus ions, and three times four waters, that's 12 waters. Now, there's no H pluses and waters to cancel out on either side of the equation there, so that's just leave it as it stands like that. Okay. In acid conditions, the MnO42 minus ion disproportionates form MnO2 and MnO4 minus. Explain in terms of oxidation numbers why disproportionation has taken place. Well, if you work out the oxidation number, like you, the usual way, sum of the oxidation numbers is equal to the charge. Work out the oxidation number there. You'll see the oxidation number for that is manganese is plus six. Here, the manganese has got an oxidation number of plus four. And here, the manganese has got an oxidation number of plus seven. Okay, so we can see, why is it disproportionation? Because, well, one of, the, one of them has become reduced. Its oxidation number has decreased. And the other one has become oxidized because its oxidation number has gone up. So that is a disproportionation reaction. Okay, and then I've, re, I've recopied down the, the electropotential values here. Explain in terms of electropotentials and equilibrium shifts why manganate six will disproportionate in acid conditions. Okay, we've got use of the table. So which two are we interested in? Well, we need the two equations with the manganate six in. So that's got, that's one with, that's got manganate six there. And this one here, the green one has got manganate six. Which one is gonna go forwards there? Uh, it's going to be, um, uh, the most positive, which is this one. It's going to take in the electrons. 
uh, and this is the most negative, so this is going to give out electrons um, and become manganate seven. Okay, uh, now electropotentials, we'll explain that in terms of electropotentials because the green one is more positive, the green one is more positive than the red one there. Okay, uh, red one, sorry. So, but we need to we just be on the safe side and make sure we get the marks. We've got to say about equilibrium and acid conditions. Well, I suppose we can say, look at this green one here, he, he, that needs H plus ions to enable it to react. And if you've got a higher concentration of H plus ions, you know, Le Chatelier will tell you that will tend to make that equilibrium uh, move in the forward direction. Okay, now this is about an alkaline hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. This is the overall reaction. So it's just hydrogen reacting with oxygen to form water and fuel cell, but it's operating under alkaline conditions, not acidic conditions. Write the equation, uh, redox system two. Okay, I'm gonna rub some of this out. Okay. Redox system two is the is the uh, positive electrode of the cell. Okay, write the half equation for the negative electrode. Well, if you see the positive half of the cell, what's happening is the oxygen is becoming um, the oxygen is is becoming reduced. So the oxygen there has got a uh, zero oxidation state here. It's got a minus two. Okay. Now, what's what's got to happen? The other one is the hydrogen has got to become um, hydrogen has 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 got to become uh, uh, reduced oxidized sorry to h plus now we'd warn me about that but that is the reaction happening under acidic conditions we've got to talk about alkaline conditions you can't have any h plus ions about how do you get rid of h plus ions what i always do, what i do is add for every h plus ion you've got to add oh minus to both sides of the equation so we're going to add two OH minuses to both sides of the equation. So we get H2 plus two OH minus. Now H plus is going to react with OH minus to form water. So it's going to give us two H2O and we have our two electrons there. So that is the reaction that is happening um, at, at, at the, uh, the negative electron electrode. Okay, the cell potential is 1.23. Calculate the electro electrode potential of the negative electrode. Right, so E cell is equal to E right minus E left. And the convention we take the E right is always the most positive. Okay. Um, so E right, they tell us, is... Um, positive electrodes the right hand side okay it's this one okay it's system two which has got a value of this one here plus 0.4 volts okay okay so e cell the cell potential the tell us is 1.23 volts e right is equal to 0.4 minus e left we don't know what e left is we arrange that e left is equal to 0.4 minus 1.23 which gives us minus 0.83 volts state one important feature of a fuel cell that is different from a conventional storage cell Okay, well, in a fuel cell, you don't recharge it. You don't recharge it by making the electrons go in the, uh, the, the, the direction they don't want to go. You, um, you, you add more fuel. You don't recharge it. So the fuel, such as like H2, whatever, and the fuel is oxidized.
Okay, so that is uh, one question. I'm going to go to a new whiteboard now for the next set of questions. Okay, so here we are. Right, okay, so we're on to question 20, which is about equilibrium, okay? Uh, we've got this equilibrium between um, uh, oxidation of nitrogen monoxide to nitrogen dioxide, right? Uh, a dynamic equilibrium exists in a closed system. State one other feature of a dynamic equilibrium, right? There's two things you can stay here. Um, uh, you can either say rate of forward reaction is equal to the rate of backward reaction, And what follows as a result of that, you can also say the concentration of the reactants and the products do not change. Okay, show that the formation of NO in equilibrium 20.1 is feasible at 25 degrees C. Well, what we need to do here is we need to work out delta G and show that delta G is negative, don't we? Okay, so delta G is equal to delta H minus T, the absolute temperature, delta S. Let's not forget the absolute temperature is 25 degrees C, so that's 298 Kelvin. And we also have to be careful there because we have to convert our delta S value. Here, we have to convert that from joules into kilojoules. So that's going to be minus 0.147 kilojoules. So let's put those numbers in and work out what delta G is. So delta G is going to be equal to uh, minus 114 minus uh, 298 multiplied by minus 0.147. Okay, that gives us minus 114 plus 43.8. Okay, and that means delta G is still negative. So delta G is minus 70.12 kilojoules per mole. So that is negative, so that means the reaction is feasible. Okay, now it's gonna ask us now, determine the maximum temperature in K for the feasibility, okay? Now, this is just before we, we do this, let's just have a look here. You can see that this term here, that's positive, okay? And that comes from that there, doesn't it, okay? That's positive. When that gets bigger than 114, delta G will become positive, and that means the reaction will not be feasible, okay? So what could make this term in the green that I've circled, what can make that bigger? Well, it's if your temperature gets bigger. Okay, so as the temperature increases, it, it will come a point when delta G will not be uh, negative, it will become positive. Now, what's the smallest temperatures when delta G is equal to zero? That's what we're going to do. So basically, you've got to do delta G, when delta G is equal to zero, that's the temperature. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so we want to find out when zero is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So let's rearrange that. T delta S is equal to delta H. So the temperature we're looking for is going to be delta H over delta S. All we've got to be careful is to use the correct units for delta S again in kilojoules. So we've got minus 114 for delta H and we've got 0.14 minus 0.147 uh, for delta S. So that obviously that's going to give us a positive value, which is just as well because of course T can only have absolute temperature can only have positive values. That gives us 775.51 kelvins. 
it does ask us to give it to the appropriate number of significant figures. Well, everything's given to three sig figs, so we shouldn't, we should only quote our temperature to three. So that we should round that up to 776 Kelvin. Okay. Okay, uh, right. Now we've got to work out KP for this reaction, given, uh, given the information they've given us here. Okay, so I've written down the, the, the um, equation again, of oxidation of NO to NO2, and it get, tells us the starting moles of each chemical, yeah? Um, right, so let's do one of these tables where we do start moles, yeah? Start moles. Moles used up and equilibrium moles. So let's read the question. It says we've got 1.6 moles of NO. We've got 1.5 of oxygen and we've got no moles of NO2. Now at equilibrium, 75% of the NO has been converted. Well, what is 75% of 1.6 moles, so that's how many we start off with, yeah? 75% of 1.6 is equal to 1.2. Okay, so we know we've used up 1.2 moles of NO. How much NO have we got left over then? 1.6 minus 1.2, that gives us 0.4. Right, if we've used up 1.2 of NO, that means we've used only half as many moles of oxygen, so that's going to be 0.6 there. So how much oxygen have we got? 1.5 minus 0.6, that gives us uh, 0.9. Obviously, we haven't used any NO2. Up. How much NO2 have we made? Well, I think the easiest way to look at that is to think, look, you've used up one, one, one mole of, two moles of that gives you two moles of that. So one mole gives you one mole. So 1.2 moles is going to give us 1.2 moles of the NO2 down there. Okay. Now we've got to work out KP. So we've got to work out mole fractions here. So we need to work out the total number of moles. Let's do that here. Total moles at equilibrium. That's 0.4 plus 0.9 plus 1.2. which gives us 2.5 moles. Uh, now, mole fraction um, is, is the next thing we're going to do. Mole fraction. We use that symbol lambda. Okay. Well, mole fraction is equal to the moles of A, or whatever you've got, over the total moles. So the mole fraction of each of those is going to be 0.4 over 2.5 and that equals 0 0.1 uh, 0 0.16 I'll just write down 0 0.16 there uh, that's going to be mole fraction of this one is 0 0.9 over 2.5 that gives us 0.4556, sorry, 0 0.036. This one is that <clears throat> over 2.5. That gives us 0.48. Now we need to work out the, the, um, the partial pressures. Okay, don't forget partial pressures is equal to the mole fraction multiplied by the total pressure. The total pressure is 1.2 megapascals. So we've got to times that by 1.21 megapascals and that gives us a total pressure of that one of 0.1936 do the same for that multiply it by 0 0.121 that gives us 0 0.4556 and for this one multiplied by 1 1.21 0 0.5808 Okay, so we've got our partial pressure values. Now we have to put them into our KP expression. 
Well, our KP expression is going to be, look at the equation up here. So KP is going to be equal to the partial pressure of NO2 squared divided by the partial pressure of the product. So that's NO squared with this and then multiply the partial pressure of O2. All right, let's put our numbers in there. So I'm going to see me writing it. I'm just I'm going to put that number, that squared. On, sorry. And I will write it out. So that's going to be this one squared, 0. 0.5808 squared over this one squared. multiplied by that 0.4556. That will give us a value and the units are going to be in megapascals so the minus one. That will give us a value of 20.66. We should give our answer to three significant figures because that's what all our data is to. So that's 20.7 megapascals to the minus one. Okay. Right. So now the chemist then repeats the exponent three times, uh, uses the same initial amounts of NO and O2, but changing in the temperature and stuff like that. Complete the table to, sh to predict the effect of each change compared with the original experiment. So I've written down the here the equation, and we need to know that it is an exothermic reaction in the forward direction. And just remind ourselves that's the expression for Kp. So if we increase the temperature, right, what's going to happen? Le Chatelier tells us it's going to, if we increase, it's going to try and decrease, move in the end of direction, it's going to go backwards. So that means we're going to get less NO2. Um, Kp, well, if we've got less NO2, look at the expression here. Uh, you're going to have a lower value of Kp. And the initial rate of the reaction, well, higher temperature is going to be greater, isn't it? It's always bigger when you increase the temperature. Now here, pressure increases, a bit of a trick question here. We always ask this, right? So increase the pressure, what's going to happen to the position of this equilibrium? Well, we've got three gas moles on the left and two on the right. So if you increase the pressure, it's going to make it forward. So we're going to get more NO2. And the temptation there is to say that means Kp is going to be um, bigger, but Kp is not affected by anything except temperature. If you don't change the temperature, you don't change the value of Kp. So no effect there. There is an explanation for that. that I've really got time to go into it, but it doesn't affect, the, it will affect the position, but not the value of Kp. Uh, the initial rate pressure increase, well, that's going to be greater as well, isn't it? The faster rate of reaction because the molecules are closer together. Right, catalyst, of course, you should know that won't change the position of equilibrium or the value of Kp, uh, but it will increase the, the rate of reaction. <clears throat> okay, end of question 20. This is about rate of reaction, okay? So we've got this reaction between thiosulfate and acid, which you probably come across the GCSE because it, and they level as well, because it, it, it's called the disappearing cross experiment. Remember it, it makes, it goes cloudy because you make a solid sulfur precipitate, okay? Investigation, the student determines how the rate is affected by the change in concentration. From these results, the student concludes the rate of reaction, the rate equation is, <clears throat> this here. In other words, it's first order with respect to thiosulfate. Uh, but because the acid doesn't appear in the rate equation, it must be zero order. Okay, so in other words, changing H plus concentration doesn't change um, the rate. So how do we explain its first order with respect to thio? That's quite easy because we look at experiment one and two. Right, you, have, you haven't done anything to the acid concentration. That stays the same. They're the same. But you've halved the thio concentration, and what happens to the rate? That halves. 
So therefore it must be first order with respect to thiosulfate. So you explain that. A bit more tricky, you've got to explain why is it zero order with respect to H plus. Well, let's look at this time, let's look at between experiment one, uh, so one and three. Right, as you go from one to three, what you're doing to the thio, con thio concentration, you are dividing it by, um, you're dividing it by eight, okay? And what you're doing to the rate of reaction? Well, that also divides by eight, okay? But what we've done there, we've also decreased, so that, that explains the change in thio concentration alone explains the decrease in the rate. We've also dropped the concentration of acid to half of its value. That obviously has no effect. So it's zero order with respect to the acid. So two marks, that's how to explain each of those marks there. Okay, now predict a possible uh, two-step mechanism for, for the reaction. Uh, and the first step is a rate determining step. Now, because H plus does not appear in the rate equation. Okay, H plus cannot be involved in the first step, can involved in the rate determining step, which is the first step here. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing is just something happens to the thiosulfate. Okay, so how can we guess that? Well, let's have a look. Well, we know we've got to make sulfur there. So let's say we make sulfur solid, yeah? And What's going to be left over if we make sulfur solid? Well, we've got, there's going to be one other sulfur plus three oxygens, and it's going to balance the charge. It's going to have to be two minus, okay? Now, that, that's the, the sulfate four ion, which does exist. So that's the first step, the rate determining step. And then that's, that's in the second step, that then reacts with the acid. So that's slow. And then, so we form the sulfur, nothing happens to that. But the SO3 two minus ion has somehow got to form SO2. By reacting with H plus, what we can probably see quite easily there, you have two H pluses. We can balance that by putting a water in there. <coughs> so that that is what's going on there. Okay, now we are on to the Arrhenius equation. The student is is determines the rate constant K of the reaction at different temperatures. Okay. And he's going to plot ln k against 1 over t. And so you need to know that's obviously going to be the Arrhenius equation, which I've written <coughs> there in red. Now, you know that you can, um, well, what we've got to do here, we just scroll down a bit, calculate the activation energy Ea for the reaction. So we, we need, you need to know the Arrhenius equation in red. You need to know how to fit it into the line of the straight line. So we plot on the y-axis, we plot uh, uh, ln k. We plot that against one over the absolute temperature. Uh, and that should give us an intercept, okay, of ln A, which we're not really bothered about. There's the intercept, let's see. What we are interested in is the gradient. And we can see the gradient M, you can see there, is going to be minus the activation energy over R, the gas constant. So if we can, we know the gas constant R, because it's in our data book. Uh, if we can work out the gradient, then we can work out the activation energy. This is fairly standard question. Okay, so we're gonna do that. So of course, gradient is equal to the change in the y-axis, which I've done in green there, divided by the change in the x-axis, which I've done in blue. Right, let's do the change in the y. Right, look, we've got that up there, sorry, bottom one so that's minus four don't forget that is a negative gradient that's pretty important as well isn't it uh, that's, that's a negative gradient m is going to be negative and we know gradient is equal to minus ea so ea has obviously always got to be a positive number so be careful of that so changing y is minus four uh, up to that point there which is about you see is minus so that's minus minus 2.4 okay which is equal to uh, minus 1.6 do the same for the uh for the uh, y-axis now then for the x-axis sorry in blue 
Okay, so we've got this value here. Right, that is 3.34 times 10 to the minus 3. Don't forget the 10 to the minus 3. So 3.33, 3, I'd say. Minus, uh, what's that value there is 3.06 times 10 to the minus 3. And that's equal to 2.7 times 10 to the minus 4. So I'll change in the x axis. Now we can put those numbers into work out the gradient m. Let's do that down here. I'll do it over here. So m is going to be equal to minus 1.6 over 2.7 times 10 to the minus 4. Um, gives us a value of minus five nine two minus five nine two five. Okay, now we need to work out the value of r. So we know this expression here: gradient is equal to minus e a over r. So e a is equal to minus the gradient multiplied by r, the gas constant. Now we have to remember, let's think, just think about our gas constant. Our gas constant has got a unit of 8 point, well, that's 8.31 joules per mole per Kelvin. So you can see our activation energy here is going to be in joules per mole, not kilojoules. Okay, that's important. So we have minus times minus minus 5925 multiplied by 8.31. Our minus sign disappears there, we've got two of them. And that becomes four nine four nine two four four joules per mole. We need to give that to a suitable number of significant figures, three, because that's what all our data is given to. And let's turn it to kilojoules divided by a thousand. So that's going to be forty nine point two kilojoules per mole. And that is, is a positive value. OK, so that is our Arrhenius equation question done. OK. A lot of work for three marks there, really. Okay. <clears throat> now, from the graph, the student estimates the value of ln a is minus two. Explain what mistake the student has made. Right. Let's have a look at. We need to have a look at the graph here. Right. Now, we've said here, ln a is the intercept on the y-axis, and so the student has obviously thought, "Oh, look at that. Extrapolate that back. That's that's." that gives you about minus two. But that is not the intercept on the y-axis because look, this is not zero, is it? That's three times 10 to minus three. Zero is you know, somewhere right over there, yeah? So uh, that, he's not read the, the scale properly and <clears throat> he's not realized that that is not the intercept on the y-axis. For one mark okay <clears throat> the student calculates the value of k in the investigation is 0.075 I've, I've copied that graph again um just make it easy sort of scroll up and down use the graph to determine the temperature at which investigation one was carried out so what we need to do first of all is we, well we said well we're plotting not k but ln k so we've got k is equal to 0 0.075 so ln k, do that on our calculator, we get a value is equal to minus, press the ln button on the calculator, minus 2.59. Okay, so now what we have to do is we have to find that on the graph and extrapolate it. So minus 2.59, right, is going to be about there. Hang on a minute. No, it's not. That's completely wrong. That's that's 2.9, not 2.59. 2.59 is about there. Okay, so our value on the on the y-axis, x-axis there is 1 over t is equal to 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3. 
uh, and take the uh, reciprocal of that to get the absolute temperature. That gives us um, 322 Kelvins. Uh, but it wants it in degrees C, so we've got to subtract um, 273. And that gives us a value of actually that's two three three two 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 point um point six. Uh, that gives us forty nine point six degrees Celsius. Okay. I think I'll continue the next question on the next whiteboard. Last couple of questions. Okay, so it's, this question is all about buffers and uh, acids and bases and stuff. Okay, right. So what we got here, right? We have got um, sodium hydroxide, strong base. Calculate the pH of a solution of sodium hydroxide. Okay, that, uh, and it's at two nine eight Kelvin. Now we do need to know the value of Kw, which of course in your data book is one point naught times ten to the minus fourteen. Uh, mole squared decimeter cubed to the minus six, if you want the units. Right, so we're going to have to use that, aren't we? So we know, right, uh, now NOH dissolves in water, so we know the concentration of OH minus is equal to 0.14 mole per decimeter cubed. It's the same here, it's completely dissolved, so that's the value. And we know that uh, H plus is equal to or H plus times OH minus is equal to Kw. We arrange, we get uh, H plus concentration is equal to Kw over OH minus concentration. Put the numbers in, 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 0.14. And that gives us um, 7.14 times 10 to the minus 14. How do we find the pH in that? pH, of course, is equal to minus log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Do that in a different color. Take a minus log of that number. And we get 13.15. Um, you should always give your pHs to 2 dp. That's what they want to see. Give them what they want. Okay, 13.15 is the answer there. Right. Now it's going off topic a little bit onto um, delta H working at enthalpy of neutralization. Okay. All right. Now, so we're going to work out the enthalpy of neutralization for this reaction here. Now, remember, it's really important here that the definition of delta H newt is per mole of water formed, okay? So we'll look at that equation there. With one mole of sulfuric acid gives us two moles of water. So you have to be careful with that, the final bit when you're working out. Remember, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so the student measures out the two solutions. He measures out some sulfuric acid and some NaOH. Uh, the temperature of the solution is the same. He mixes them and measures the temperature increase. Shows that the sodium hydroxide is in excess. So we need to work out the moles of, okay? So we need to do the moles of uh, H2SO4. That's equal to concentration times volume. So that's uh, 1.6 multiplied by 0.025 gives us 0 0.04, I believe. Yep. 
yeah, 0 0.04. Okay, so now how many moles of NaOH will this react with? Well, one mole of sulfuric acid reacts with two of NaOH. So that, let's write down there, that reacts with double the moles of NaOH with 0 0.08 moles of NaOH. Now we need to work out the moles of NaOH. Let's do that. Concentration times volume. The concentration of the NaOH is 1.5 and the volume is 55 centimeters cubed. So that's 0 0.055. Do that. What do we get? We get 0 0.08, something a bit, bit 8 to 5 moles, okay, of NaOH, which is a bit more than we need. We only need point, only 0 0.08 moles of the NaOH is going to react with the sulfuric acid. Now that's really important because we now know, right, 0 0.08 moles of this react um, So we are going to form 0 0.08 moles of water. Going to be important in the next bit where we work out delta. We're going to work out the delta uh, H neutralization now. So let's do that. So the equations we need is we need Q is equal to MC delta T. Q is the quantity of heat released in the reaction there. Right. So that's the mass of water. The mass of water is going to be, well, we've got 25 and 55 together. That makes 80 centimeters cubed of water. And so that means we've got 80 grams of water times C, the specific heat capacity, that's 4.18, multiplied by delta T, which is 13 degrees C. Okay, so that gives us, um, that gives us a value of 4,347 joules. Now we need to work out delta H. So delta H is equal to um, Q, the quantity of heat released in the, in, the, in the experiment, divided by the moles of H2O produced. Okay, so that's going to be 4347. And we worked out earlier that the number of moles of water being produced is the same as the moles of, mole, moles of NOH which react, which is like 0 0.08, okay? I wrote it up here. I just will scroll that down just a little bit. Look, 0 0.08 moles of water are formed. Okay, so it's important to remember it's, it is per mole of water, not per mole of sulfuric acid. So it's divided by 0 0.8, and that gives us a value there of 5,400. Six and the units are joules per mole there of water. Uh, we need to convert that into kilojoules and we need to give it to the correct number of significant figures, which is going to be three. So that's what our data is given to. You look at all these data, they're all given to three sig figs here. Yeah. So that's going to become 54.3 kilojoules per mole. And really importantly, you're going to lose a mark if you don't forget that. There's a temperature increase of 13. So this is exothermic. So we need to put a minus sign in there to show it's exothermic. Okay, so we've done that. Okay, now I made a bit of space there. I don't actually need, need that. Okay, it was four marks for doing that. Anyway, we've done that, done that bit already. Yep. Okay. The student repeats the experiment using 50 centimeters cubed of, <coughs> of, of sulfuric. So okay, so just put this is the original, yeah in that red box there. So they've doubled, you can see, look, they've doubled <coughs> the moles of sulfuric acid, yeah? Because uh, they've doubled the volume of it. And they've also doubled the volume of the NaOH. Okay, now you might think, okay, so you've doubled the number of moles, so you produce twice as, so Q is gonna be two times bigger, isn't it? 
but the temperature doesn't increase because of course m the mass of the water has also doubled so the temperature change will be exactly the same yes you've doubled the amount of heat released q is twice as big but the volume of water you've got to heat up the mass of water you've got to heat up that's also doubled so the temperature change will be 13 degrees c be the same again okay so if you want to use it if you wanted to get a bigger temperature rise you know for whatever reason you wanted in this experiment you, know, you can't just do it by adding more volumes of solution you've got to actually increase the concentrations of the solution yeah if you do that you do get more heat released without increasing the amount of water that you're heating up Okay, and this is the last question on the paper. It's six marks, and it is basically a buffer calculation. Okay, so nitr nitrous acid, HNO2, not nitric acid, is a weak acid, okay, and it's got a pK value there, 3.4, 3.34. Uh, you can make uh, HNO2 can be prepared by reacting with this N2O3 with water, okay, and NO2. Okay, so before we do the buffering, let's do a bit of a funny order. Let's um, determine, well, determine the pH buffer and let's work out the mass of NO2 that was used in step one. Let's do that first of all. Let's put, okay, so it says here you react N2O3 with water. And the only product you get is nitrous acid, HNO2. So how do you balance that? Well, you just have to put a two there and it's balanced, isn't it? Okay, so now. Um, what mass of NO2 do we need? Well, it tells us, look, when the chemist weighed a sample step one, and he made 100 centimeters cubed of 0.5 molar nitrous acid. So we can work out the moles of nitrous acid. Let's do that. That's going to be equal to the concentration times by the volume. So that's 100 centimeters concentration, 0.5. 100 centimeters cubed, that's 0.1 dm cubed. So that's 0 0.05. Moles. So that's how much of any moles of nitrous acid we're going to make. So how many moles of NO2 do we need to do that? Well, to make 0 0.05 moles of actually it's a one to two ratio. We're going to need 0 0.025 moles of N2O3. So let's work out the mass of that many moles of N2O3. Okay, so mass is equal to moles times MR, the MR of N2O3. That's going to be two times 14 for the nitrogens, plus three times 16 for the oxygens, which gives us 76. So that's going to be 0 0.025 times 76 which is equal to 1.9 grams. So that's the, that's, that's the very last bit of the question we've just done now. Then now I'm going to rub that out and we're going to do the um, pH calculation thing, okay? And we do this. Okay, now we're doing a buffer calculation. Uh, so let's, let's see, what else did it say here? Um, chemist adds, so look at step two, the chemist adds some sodium hydroxide to the nitrous acid. Okay, explain why a buffer solution forms in step two. Okay, so we kind of, um, right, what do we need for a buffer solution for a buffer? you need a mixture of a weak acid, HNO2 in this case, and it's HA, and it's conjugate base, which is A minus. So what's the conjugate base here is NO2 minus. Okay, and why, why do you, why do you, we add sodium hydroxide? Well, if you add sodium hydroxide to nitrous acid, so, and some of it is going to react to form Let's just do that as an ionic equation. 
OH minus, you're going to get some H2O and NO2 minus. Okay, so we, we do have a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base, so that's why we've got a buffer solution. Right, now let's do the calculation bit. Right, I'm going to write that equation down again here, so we're going to have um, nitrous acid uh, plus OH minus, and it's going to form NO2 minus and H2O. Right, so I need to work out, I'm going to put down here, start moles. And final moles. Okay, so the start moles of uh, HNO2, well, we worked out that before. That is concentration times volume. That's 0 0.1 times 0 0.5, so that's 0 0.05. And the start moles of NaOH, well, we've got concentration times volume there. That's 0 0.15 times 0 0.1. So that's going to be 0 0.015 of that. We haven't got any of the weak acid or the weak of the conjugate base to start off with. We don't care about the water. Now, what happens when they react? So HNO2 reacts in a one-to-one -one ratio with OH minus. So the concentration of HNO2 is going to go down by that. So it's going to be 0 0.05 minus 0 0.015, which is equal to 0 0.035. Okay, and every one mole of OH minus is going to give us one mole of NO2, so that's going to be 0 0.015 there. Okay. Uh, now, final concentration of those two. Now let's see what let's see why we're doing this. Okay, so whenever you want to work out uh, the pH of a buffer solution, uh, right, we've got our expression for Ka. Ka, I'll do H plus times A minus over concentration of HA. Now, if you want to work out the pH of a buffer, I tend to rearrange that so we get H plus as the subject. We end up with Ka multiplied by the concentration of HA dot, I mean multiplied, over A minus. So we need to find out, we want to find out the value of H plus. We need to substitute in the values on this side for Ka, the concentration of HA and the concentration of A minus. Let's do that. Right. Now, the final moles of HNO2 is 0 0.035. So the final concentration is going to be that divided by the volume. Okay. And the final concentration of NO2 is the moles divided by the volume. And you can probably see those two volume terms are going to cancel out when we put them into the equation. So we don't need to know what they are. So let's put the numbers in anyway. So H plus. H plus is equal to, right, Ka. We need to know the value of Ka. Now it tells us the value of pKa. So it says pKa is equal to, in this case, the question tells us the pKa is, Uh, 3.34. So that means Ka is equal to 10 to the power of minus 3.34. Okay, so I'm going to put that in there. Multiplied by the concentration of HA. Well, HA is this 0 0.035 over volume. divided by the concentration of A minus 0 0.015 over volume. Let's get rid of those volumes. We're going to cancel them out. All we need to do now is put those numbers into our calculator to work out the concentration of H plus. Right, if you do that, you work out concentration is equal to 1.066 times 10 to the minus 3. 
multiple decimeter cubed. And all we have to do now is to work out the pH. So that's take the, take the log of it, minus log of it, minus log 1.066 times 10 to the minus three. And that gives us a value of 2.97. Okay. Uh, and again, two pHs to two decimal places. Uh, that is the last question on the paper. Okay. So that's the end of that video.